Serialization is the process of converting an in-memory data structure into some on-the-wire format for communication, either network or storage. We ran an experiment to show just how much overhead serialization can add to one of these microsecond scale apps. So here, the application takes in a packet, deserializes it to a struct, reserializes the same struct, and sends it back out. We compare it to a baseline that doesn't do any serialization or deserialization, just echoing the packet. Looking at the achieved load against tail latency, this baseline achieves about 77 gigabits per second at 50 microseconds. Now, adding serialization to this app reduces its throughput by about 80% to 13 to 15 gigabits per second. So what's causing all this throughput loss? Let's take a closer look. So we have these applications that have some data in memory, and they eventually want this data to be sent out by the NIC, so they eventually want this memory to end up in some contiguous format prepended by some headers in NIC memory. Here, the app is a key value store, and the application eventually wants buff2, buff5, and string6 to end up in a contiguous packet with some headers in NIC memory. To do this, the application might write code using the generated serialization API that looks like this. So here, the application is initializing a struct to contain the values, appending each of the values to the struct, and then serializing the struct, and then sending it out over the network. Under the hood, the serialization library is allocating space to hold the three values along with an object header that the deserializer uses later to index the data, and it copies the three values into this new space. Unfortunately, we're not done here. The networking stack maintains additional pinned buffers because NICs can only access certain pages of pinned unswappable memory. So on send, this entire payload will be copied again into a networking stack buffer along with a packet header. Finally, the NIC can access this over PCIe and send it out over the network. So we've seen that this path from getting application data to the NIC in some contiguous format uses two copies when using network serialization today. You may have heard of this thing called zero CPU copy, or more commonly referred to as zero copy APIs. Can we use those here to reduce the copies in serialization and remove its overhead? And surely zero copies must be better than two copies. And the answer that I'll explain through the rest of this talk is yes, we can use these APIs, but they come with a bunch of trade-offs that need to be carefully managed. So in the rest of this talk, I'll go through the motivation and challenges associated with applying zero copy APIs to serialization and the design, implementation, and evaluation of Cornflakes, a new general purpose zero copy serialization library. So first off, what are these zero copy APIs? Here we have the same example where the application is serializing buff2, buff5, and string6. Before, the application copied all the data into a single buffer and told the NIC to fetch a single pointer. Instead, we can take advantage of the NIC's direct memory access capabilities. Specifically, we can tell the NIC about where the headers lay, which we might materialize in memory separately, and we can tell the NIC the direct pointers to buff2, buff5, and string6. The NIC can use its scatter gather capabilities to gather these different non-contiguous memory pointers into a single contiguous buffer on NIC memory and send it out. So this is great. This allows us to remove the copies in serialization. But it doesn't come without complications. So the main complication here is from some extra programming com complexity the stack has to offer something for. So first, what happens if the application frees one of these values the NIC hasn't finished sending yet? In this case, the application could reallocate that address to, for a new buffer and partially fill it with new data before the NIC is finished sending the old data. The second complication is, I mentioned that NICs can only access this pin memory. What happens if one of the pointers we told the NIC to fetch is not in this pin memory? Now, these complications do have known or simple solutions, but these solutions lead to the stack accessing more metadata and a generally larger working set size for the application. For the first problem, 
Stacks like DPDK and DemiKernel use per buffer reference counts to ensure memory safety is correct. So here, if the application freeze, uh, sorry, here when the networking stack starts sending buff five, it'll increment the reference count. Now, if the application freeze this mid send, the reference count decrements, but the value can't be reallocated until the NIC is done with it. For the second problem, we can imagine that the stack keeps track of the pages that are pinned and not pinned and accordingly copies any data that the NIC can't access into pin memory. Unfortunately, we find that this extra metadata the stack has to access, particularly the reference counts for memory safety, increase the working set size of the application, and this can cause extra cache misses such that the zero copy solution isn't even beneficial anymore. So this graph shows the difference in throughput for copying non-contiguous data structures versus using scattergather to uh, gather all the data in the NIC directly. We see here that raw scattergather always beats copy. However, if we consider this extra cache miss that can occur from this reference count access per buffer, we find that there's a different trade-off. Now, copy is actually better than scattergather for buffers of size 256 bytes and below. So in summary, when considering this extra working set size from the reference counts, copy can actually beat zero copy for small objects. So we've seen a couple of challenges in applying zero copy APIs to serialization. The first one is that it's not always good to zero copy because for small objects, the trade-off might be that copying is better. The second problem is there are these two representations, copy and zero copy. And with the existing APIs, programmers have to manually reason about the two, both based on performance and memory location. The third problem is we somehow have to get these application data pointers into a form that the NIC can understand so it constructs the correct contiguous buffer on the NIC. We found that having a stack where serialization was a separate layer from networking added extra overhead. In this talk, I'll present Cornflakes. Cornflakes applies zero copy to serialization and contributes the following. A measurement study that shows when zero copy is useful in the context of serialization. An efficient hybrid copy zero copy API that hides the complexity of this decision from the programmer and a co-design API between serialization and networking that allows for various performance optimizations, such as one I'll discuss today called combined serialize and send. So I'll go through the major aspects of the Cornflakes library design and how they tackle these three challenges. For the first question of how should we decide between zero copy and copy, Cornflakes uses an efficient heuristic to choose the mechanism of copy or zero copy at runtime, which is derived from this measurement study. For the second question of how the hybrid API should be transparent, Cornflakes represents data as either copy or zero copy without extra programmer effort. So in the case that the programmer passes a raw pointer that's not in pin memory, Cornflakes will transparently copy it to a pin buffer. For the third, the API between serialization and networking, Cornflakes introduces a novel optimization called serialize and send. For today, I'll just be discussing the first and third design aspect with you. So for the first question, how does Cornflakes decide which data to copy and which data to zero copy, Cornflakes uses a greedy heuristic that's based on a size threshold. And I'll break down exactly what that means. I've shown the same example here, serializing buff two, buff five, and string six. I've also shown the reference counts for the pinned values. In the programming snippet, when the programmer calls append, Cornflakes has to make a decision. It can either represent this data as a zero copy reference, and this means it has to increment the reference count immediately to protect against races from the time this is appended to the data structure, or it can copy the data, and this obviously requires accessing the underlying data. Both of these code paths increase the working set size of the application. One is by accessing the reference count and one is by accessing the data and they both could cause a cache miss. So it's important that Cornflakes never does both for any value. 
So Cornflakes uses a greedy heuristic to choose this across all of the buffers. And what this means is that Cornflakes will decide on the decision for each buffer individually rather than considering all of the values together. So in this example here, it uses a size threshold. So Cornflakes looks at buff two, sees the size is larger than the threshold, and decides to use zero copy, incrementing the reference count associated with buff two. For buff five, it sees the size is smaller than the threshold, decides to use copy, and never accesses the reference count. For string six, because the value is not pinned, Cornflakes will decide to use copy, and we get the following representation of scatter gather entries sent to the NIC, where the first entry contains the copied values behind the headers, and the second entry contains the pointer to buff two. I mentioned this threshold that we use for deciding between copy and zero copy. There are more details in the paper about this, but we use a measurement study to determine the value of what this threshold should be on a per hardware basis. For the hardware we evaluated on, we found that 512 bytes was the optimal uh, value for this threshold. But the paper contains more details on the intuition behind this value, as well as how we expect it could change on different hardware platforms. Now, to discuss the API between serialization and networking, Let's go back to this code snippet from before. After appending all of the values to the data structure, the programmer calls serialize and sends the result of serialize into this networking stack. What is this serialize actually doing? If, serial if this were implemented in some existing zero copy networking stack, serialize is responsible for taking the get m representation of the data and turning it into something the networking stack accepts. Existing zero copy networking stacks like DBDK have an API where they accept these intermediate linked lists of pointers. So serialize is responsible for turning this get M struct into this list of pointers so the networking stack can then send it out uh, on the network. Cornflakes eliminates this intermediate representation and the networking stack API directly accepts these Cornflakes serializable objects. The way it does this is that the generated code exposes further functionality that allows the networking stack to finish serialization. And we also had to use a direct driver's implementation rather than relying on the general purpose networking API uh, from DPDK. We found that this optimization provided throughput gains because it eliminated this intermediate representation of the scatter gather array. The Cornflakes implementation involves an application library that generates Rust code and C bindings. We currently support the Mellanox OFED and Intel ICE drivers, and we have a partial integration with DemiKernel. We've currently supported a custom key value store and echo server used to compare to other general purpose serialization libraries. And we've integrated Cornflakes inside Redis to replace Redis serialization. We evaluated on Cloud Lab and we turned on Jumbo Frames, so the maximum packet size we were considering was about 8,000 bytes. The main question we look at today is for a particular tail latency SLO, can Cornflakes achieve a higher load? So the first trace, or the trace I'm gonna discuss today in the talk is a trace derived from the OSDI Twitter cache trace analysis paper a few years ago. We took a subset of this trace, modified it to make any larger than jumbo frame objects, sub objects that were each a jumbo frame. And for the particular subset that we served, we found th about 32% of the values queried are about larger, are larger than the size threshold. This graph shows the trade-off of achieved load versus tail latency for cornflakes on the right against the other software serialization methods. Looking at the P99 latency of about 50 microseconds, Cornflakes achieves between 15 and 45% higher throughput. Now looking at Cornflakes integrated inside Redis, Cornflakes achieves about 8.8% higher throughput at 59 microseconds. The reason the relative gain in Redis is less is because Redis's data structures are heavier than those of the custom key value store, meaning more cycles are spent per packet and any benefit from serialization and networking will be relatively less. Finally, for today, we look at the gain of this hybrid approach against only scatter gather for the same Twitter cache trace. For this particular trace, 
the gains are pretty slight, only 2 to 3 percent at 50 microseconds. But I will note that cornflakes being hybrid can serve both traces that have predominantly small values, where it'll fall back to the performance of the baselines, as well as traces that have predominantly large values, where zero copy will have a huge benefit. There are more results in the paper on other traces as well. I want to note that the work I've discussed here today has shown these trade-offs for certain hardware that we explored as well as a particular implementation of the system that we built. We'd like to explore this measurement study on further hardware platforms as well as consider other implementations of some of the mechanisms, such as maybe a better way to do memory safety other than reference counting. In summary, Cornflakes accelerate serialization without new hardware using NIC scattergather. We learned that serialization benefits from coalescing data in the NIC, but for small buffers, copying can actually outperform this hardware offload because of the extra working set size leading to cache misses from these reference count accesses. We also learned that the performance benefits from the co-designed serialization networking interface that eliminates these intermediate representations of the data instead of having a more general purpose networking interface with scatter gather arrays. I put some links here for how to get started with cornflakes as well as my email if you'd like to contact me. Thank you for your time and I'm ready to take any questions. Uh, hello, uh, Shubham Mishra from UC Berkeley. Uh, very nice talk. So uh, I'm curious about the heuristic that, uh, for the threshold uh, for, for between zero copy and copy. And I was wondering, like, uh, if there is a correlation between, uh, like, small values that are present in the CPU cache when you are copying it, or if it is not present in the CPU cache, does it affect the threshold? Yeah, so I think one factor which we discussed further in the paper that could affect the threshold on a more per uh, workload basis is definitely the, the cache behavior of the workload or the hot set of the workload or what values are accessed more. Um, that being said, there is a trade-off between how complicated this heuristic could be to implement in the code in a very fast way that still provides gains versus more complicated things that might be more optimal and take more things into account. So I think that's definitely possible that um, something that considers what's present in the cache or what's, what's been more recently accessed would probably lead to better results, but uh, that there's also a trade-off there because of how it could be more, it could just take more cycles to actually run. Uh, yeah, hope uh, that answers and, the question. Yeah, uh, thank you, and uh, second follow-up question to that is that is the heuristic like uh, per pair of like CPU and network hardware and how does it like work when there are like heterogeneous systems with different types of uh, hardware? Yeah, so I think intuitively the threshold kind of represents uh, the time it takes for the stack to copy a certain value uh, into the existing scatter gather entry at the front versus the time it would take to add an extra scatter gather entry for that value. And that includes both the, the time um, to do the memory safety, as well as add an extra scatter gather entry on the ring buffer, as well as any NIC related factors. But uh, in our implementation so far, we found we were mostly bottlenecked by the CPU factors of the stack itself. Um, yeah, so I hope that answered. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We thank the speaker one more time.